Good evening. Um, the diameter of your hair is measured in microns, and a thousand times as smaller than a micron is a nanometer. So that's roughly, a nanometer is to a meter, the same as this cup is to the diameter of the Earth. That's a nanometer, it's very small. Um, nanotechnology, the capacity to visualize and manipulate and fabricate matter at the nanometer scale, it started in the 1980s. And I wrote this book, Nano Comes to Life, to survey uh, what has happened since the 1980s, uh, to look at the convergence of nanotechnology and biology, how nanotechnology is actually transforming the way we think about biology and the way we do medicine. But more importantly, I think, and I will try to convince you tonight, is changing the merger of sciences in biology and especially nanotechnology the very intellectual framework in which we are starting to develop technology in the 21st century. Things are different, and I will try to show you how. So, um, for most of you, um, modern medicine would look like something like this. Um, a kind of a male, usually male hand. Um, uh, yeah, the iconography is, is very telling. Um, manipulating your DNA. So, um, and here, funnily enough, you have a brain and your eyes. So what modern medicine, at least in the books uh, that many people read and the press that we, many of us look at, is going to be about just changing your genes and then you will fix anything you want, disease or not, about your body. And nanotech in the popular culture comes like this. So it's substituting the hand of the male um, scientist for some nanobots that look like uh, metal structures that somehow go into your uh, body and fix uh, your genes. Well, none of this has any scientific basics whatsoever. Um, you cannot change your brain, changing your genes, and you cannot uh, modify your DNA using metallic bots. Now, where does this all come from, and why is it so important uh, that we remove these ideas uh, from the uh, popular uh, vision of science? So, let's start looking at microscopy um, and start. Trying to understand, I'm going to do a bit of history, how humans understood what is inside of us. So, um, as humans from the early civilizations, we've been interested in where, where we come from and where are we made of. And in the 17th century, Robert Hooke in Oxford, Lofenbeck in the Netherlands, started to build the first microscopes that allowed people to look into matter. Um, Lofenbeck was... Uh, interested in trade, he was a capitalist, he was interested in using microscopes to measure how many threats uh, the materials he was, or people were trying to sell were, were having, so they could put a price to it. But Robert Hooke was starting to look at matter. So these are the famous pictures of Robert Hooke uh, with a microscope, which first discovered that cork, in this case plants, were made of cells. He called them cells, these little things, um, because it reminded him of the rooms where the monks in monasteries used to live, actually. So it took quite a long time, so in the 17th century to 20th century, to keep going deep into biological matter to understand what was inside. And the breakthroughs came with X-ray diffraction. So if you have uh, a crystal, so a little piece of matter with a lot of atoms in them arranged in, a, in an array and you throw X-rays, the X-rays bend, and from the pattern of the X-rays you can reconstruct the shape of the things that are made of this crystal. So in the 1950s, people like uh, Crick and Rosalind Franklin were started to be interested in using this technique that actually was demonstrated by the Braggs here in this room. And you can see the, the painting outside of the Braggs. Um, <clears throat> uh, to use this technique to see what we were made of. And everybody was starting to suspect that a substance called that the DNA might be fundamental for the origin of life. So, Rosalind Franklin, working with Maurice Wilkins and Ray Gorsling in King's College London, he got some fibers of DNA made from 
a Swiss guy, Rudolf Singer, who, who made them from the sweet breads of Swiss calves. He made some very good material that he could send from Switzerland and last a long time. And she produced a famous uh, photograph, 51, many other photographs. So she became really good at making the X-ray experiments. It was a very difficult experiment to make. And from the diffraction pattern, so how the X-rays diffracted from this crystal, um, they all together uh, discover the structure of DNA. Famously, Watson and Crick got the Nobel Prize. He got a tumor and died um, and didn't get any Nobel Prize. Uh, these guys were also forgotten. Wilkins got the Nobel Prize. And I think the iconography here, again, is pretty uh, clear. We can see Watson and Crick happily uh, discussing and Rosalind Franklin doing the hard work. And, uh, <laughs> Yeah, and um, yeah, this is uh, one of the most famous um, topics in gender politics ever done in, in history of science. It's very complicated because uh, Rosalind Franklin actually suspected, and I think we all think knew it was, a, it was a double helix. But like many women, including now women scientists, we, we tend to do too many experiments until we are perfectly sure that it's true. Uh, we, are, we have to be perfectionists. It's not that we are stupid and we are not clever enough to realize that the things are, but it's just very difficult for us to get accepted. And in this mess, um, Watson and Crick were very fast. <laughs> anyway, so from X-ray diffraction and the techniques of biochemistry that has started to be developed in the mid uh, 20th century, we discover something wonderful. We're made of nanostrings. All the constituents that make you and make me are nano-sized molecules, and most of them take the shape of strings. And the strings will be important later in this lecture. So it's not just DNA, but the proteins that you're made of um, are strings that are folded into shapes. So this is one of the first convergences of nanotechnology with biology. In the moment people started to be able to have techniques to, in, to manipulate nanomaterials. Immediately, everybody thought, let's go and do something with biomolecules. So, as I said, not only DNA, but also proteins uh, are made of strings, and you can get uh, structure. So this is one of the reasons why we have things like the diamond in the UK. The diamond facility is a synchrotron near Oxford that is, was built mainly to get the structures of proteins. Why? Because with the discovery of DNA and proteins, pharmacology and the discovery of drugs moved into the nanoscale. So everybody wants to get the structures of proteins because then you can find out if a protein is, is, is part of a disease and then you can design a drug and kill the protein, or so does the paradigm go. As I'll tell you later, this is not as easy or successful as, we do, as, we, as they thought initially. So, over the last oof, oof, 70 years, uh, using a variety of techniques from biochemistry, from molecular cell biology, X-ray diffraction, lots of departments in the world working on this, we started to identify all the proteins, that are, all the stuff that is inside the body. We still don't know how many proteins we have. Uh, we know we have around 20,000 genes. But these 20,000 genes, as I will tell you later, they're able to make hundreds and hundreds of thousands of proteins. The size of the, the quantity of different amount of different building blocks we are made of is unknown. People think that it can be something from the hundreds of thousands to the millions. So the cell and the DNA inside the cell is able to construct all millions and millions of different materials at the nanoscale within your bodies. But for most of the 20th century, all we cared was about building techniques to identify molecules and then building drugs to, to, kill to sort of kill or target individual molecules at the nanoscale. And nobody actually bothered in understanding what was the relationship between the environment and the DNA and the proteins, or some people bother, but it was not the main, the main target of research. And biology became one of the most reductionist fields of science. So reductionism is thinking about the world and trying to find out what are the bits of the world. This is what most science did 
indeed from the 17th century, 18th century, 19th century, and 20th century. So people who build microscopes, do look, or, or techniques, look at what they're building blocks of life, and then, or life, or, or anything else, and then try to figure out what were the relationships between them. This is basically what physicists were doing, and indeed biologists did in the 20th century. The problem of doing this is that in the last 20 years, we haven't produced new drugs. Uh, we have produced antibiotic, or well, the bacteria have reacted to antibiotics, and we have antibiotic resistance. So somehow, our attempts to reduce um, biology to building blocks are failing. We are not understanding how biology reacts to our attempts to deal with the building blocks. So, of course, um, it was very convenient to just focus on genes and proteins from a political point of view. So, uh, if you read the book Superior by Angela Saini, who is getting so many prizes this year, um, a lot of political agendas were looking at DNA as a part of a metric between human beings. With DNA, if we knew what we were made of, we would discover if someone was better than others. It was a new metric to create relationships between in colonial settings or indeed between gender. And also, reductionism has been the basics of developing technologies in the 20th century. So how have we developed most of the technologies we have even from around us? So we find the building blocks of life, of anything. We try to figure out how are the interactions between those building blocks. And then we translate that into tools that we use to modify the world, the biological world in the type of medicine. We try to identify what are the building blocks and then we build a drug to get rid of that building block when we have a disease. Or we have done that in all sorts of uh, realms of life. In agriculture, we were creating um, a lot of chemicals that will make uh, agriculture very productive, and then now we find out that they're killing the bees, that they're killing, that what we destroy in the soil, that we create, we're killing our microbiome, having too much vitamins. So for a long time, we believe in molecules and building blocks as the key that would allow us to conquer disease, as the key that would allow us to actually conquer nature. And what we are learning right now, both with antibiotic resistance, with the resistance that tumors are able to uh, develop against your drugs, are indeed the ecosystem, the, the catastrophic uh, climate change and, and change of, of the ecosystem that we're going to have to live on in the 21st century. We're learning that we cannot treat nature as building blocks. Nature is complex and reacts back to us. Um, so, I argue that one of the main changes that happened in the way we deal with technology was the arrival of nanotechnology. As I said at the beginning, in the 1980s, we created the first techniques that would allow us to measure and visualize matter at the nanometer scale. I'm going to take you to a picture, which is very important in my life. I was a student at the University of Madrid when I saw this picture for the first time. It's uh, images taken by a scanning tunnel and microscope. What you hear here at the background is the surface of copper. The scanning tunnel and microscope was the first uh, microscope that would allow you to see individual atoms one by one. And it doesn't do it with light or with electrons. It uses a sharp tip that I just showed here and to, to, to basically feel the surfaces by their interaction and kind of feeling the surfaces by touch at the atomic scale. When you do that, and that's a very clever microscope, you can see atoms. This, the background here is copper, and these are copper atoms in the background. And this guy, Don Eigler in IBM, in Almaden, figured a way to evaporate uh, iron atoms at the surface. So these little bottle hills are iron atoms. And he lowered very much the temperature, so you're just above zero Kelvin, so the atoms don't move around. And he figured out with that nano finger, with that nano tip I showed you before, to pick them up from the surface and start to arrange them in a circle. This is the first ever uh, example of humans manipulating matter at atomic scale. And it's showing you, of course, it's not a very productive way of building anything. It's very reductionist. It's just building blocks and putting together. But I want you to look at the middle. And in the middle, you see a ripple. So this is nature playing. You, with your building blocks, you made a silly circle but nature is coming back with an perhaps unexpected behavior, a complex behavior. 
This ripple is produced by electrons. The reason why the smooth surface of copper is because it's a metal, and in metals, electrons flow. That's why we have electricity. And in here, the electrons are confined in this a coral made of iron atoms. And that's why you have a ripple, because the electrons behave as a wave and they're behaving as a liquid. Um, so in this picture, like, that, that changed my life. I decided I wanted to go into this field. But also it's very telling of where I'm going to tell you from now on. When you try to build things in nature with building blocks, supposedly in simple ways, Nature always reacts with a complex behavior. Because the matter in nature is entangled with each other and with the environment. And when many things start to interact with each other, we have unexpected behaviors. That's why when you modify a little bit of your DNA, you don't know where it's going to come out in the other end. Because you're going to change one of these little building blocks in a much more complex system than in the little circle and it will come out in unexpected behaviors that evolution has mastered. So we'll talk about later. So, people like me started to use these microscopes to try to understand what we could do with matter at the nanoscale. We wanted to revolutionize electronics, we wanted to create the nanobots maybe, we wanted to create matter and we wanted to look for what things we could do if we could um, uh, control matter at the nanometer scale. And immediately, many of us, uh, I think I'm from the second generation of nanotechnologies, the first ones came in the 1980s, I started in the 1990s, we started to look at biology. The reason was that in the 1990s, we were starting to get the first crystal structures, dead, coming from X-ray diffraction, of what it looked like life nanomachines. We were starting to learn that the proteins in our body were not static, they had int intriguing shapes that seemed to point out to very complex behaviors. I tell you one beautiful example. This is the Nobel Prize that was given to Paul Boyer, John Walker in the UK, and Jens Sko in Aarhus in Denmark, of the structure of ATP synthase. You have kilograms of this protein in your body. It's a tiny thing and produces the ATP in your body. So your body requires this molecule to produce energy, to, pr to, to create movement within our bodies. Now, how does nature produce it? You know catalysis? When you hear about catalysis in a car, it's usually a small particle, so just powder that catalyzes a chemical reaction. What does it mean to catalyze a chemical reaction? When you have two chemicals together, you want them to have a chemical reaction, you can, have some, you can get them to bind somewhere, and that facilitates that the things get moving. But nature has perfected an amazing machine. So from the first crystal structures, it looked like nature had created a rotary motor. So sitting on the cell, sitting on cells in your body, there could be something like that, that it looked like it could rotate. So nature was trying to create like a rotary motor to facilitate the rotation and create a lot of catalysis. Now, it is known now that your bodies will need about turnaround 60 kilograms of ATP molecules a day to just move around. So nature needs to find a really efficient way to produce these molecules all the time. And it doesn't do it like in a test tube of the chemistry department. It produces a nanomachine that can rotate. I was in Japan doing my PhD when I met Hiroyuki Noji, who was the first one who demonstrated that the ATP synthase rotated. So us, the ones that were looking and building the new microscopes, I started to dream of building microscopes that could see these things in action. We didn't have to imagine them just by the shape of them, so can we actually see these? We were nanotechnologists, so we were not only interested in looking at them, we wanted to know how they worked. We wanted to know the engineering of these molecules. So these are uh, images from my lab. Um, we built atomic force microscopes would allow us to see, for example, this is real DNA. So real DNA is not like the DNA in the pictures you get in the books. It's twisted, it's convoluted, the double helix um, is twisted. Sometimes it's open, sometimes it's crossed. Um, these are proteins. And most importantly, we started to be able, 
and with the main contribution of Toshio Ando in, in Kanazawa University in Japan, to build microscopes that were able to let us look at nature as it looks at the nanometer scale at our own proteins. What you see here at the bottom is a work from my lab. We were looking at rhodopsins, so some of the proteins that you have inside your eyes that fill, and they're in a constant shaking as they open and they close. But let me take you to the ATP synthase. So a collaboration between Ando and Noji Sensei here at the top, that's the ATP synthase, allow humans for the first time to look from the top of the ATP synthase and see how it moves as it's producing the rotations and the molecules. But maybe more striking is the movie you have at the bottom. Can you see something walking there? That's a protein, that's myosin. You have kilograms of this protein in your body again. It's responsible from your hearing, from the movement of your muscles, from the stretching. Every movement pretty much that involves a cellular movement involves one of these molecular motors, as we call that walk. So this protein sits on a track, as you see here. Right now it's sitting on the tracks of all your cells doing that, because otherwise you will just be floppy. You need to create tension, and this thing just pulls from the cells to create tension, and does this with a remarkable thing. It's just able to walk. Now, this started, I think, these and other techniques. There are other techniques that people have used to study biological molecular motors. It changes completely the way we think about matter. It takes time to sink. I think it's started to sink now, the meaning of all this. First you produce the microscopes, then you get the papers, and then we start the thinking, what have we done, and what, how is this useful? Um, and it tells us something about why biology happens at the nanoscale. Now look at these pictures. So where you're at the nanoscale, and you're a little thing like that, myosin, sitting on the track. You're so small that when the water molecules around you move, they hit you, you are able to use that energy to produce movement in one direction. How do you do that? A bit like a windmill when you have the air flowing through the windmill and produce movement in one direction. Evolution has managed to create nanomachines that are underpin our life. We need them. This is the way life works. Um, by creating mechanical machines that use the temperature and the water around them to produce movements in one direction, for example, or rotation. This rotation, in the case of the ATP synthase, is what we use to create a chemical reaction that goes very fast, totally efficient. Why? The molecule grabs, so the rotary motor and the protein grabs the molecule, bends it, and when you bend the molecule, you're so small, you're at the nanoscale, you get the electron jump and you catalyze a chemical reaction. That's what life emerges on Earth at the nanometer scale. Because at some point, and I will discuss that later, and molecules start to be able to put together mechanics, electricity, light, chemistry, everything together to create structures, to store information, and to create deterministic movements and complexity. We emerged from this. At the time we started to do this, we were just interested in the engineering. And I think one of the reasons why nanotechnology changes the game in biology is that because we don't look at this as biologists just trying to see genes and proteins. You know? We're trying to see how does this work. It's the engineering ethos of nanotechnology that I think changes a lot the game. At this time, there was a famous book that I think was also very influential, and maybe some of you have read it, Engines of Creation by Eric Dressler, who, who was at MIT at the time, and he was the first one to realize that in the future we will be building matter in somehow using the tricks of biology I showed you before. It was a very controversial book, famously quoted in this country by Prince Charles, who was very worried about um, a nanotech good that would come out of uh, the labs and destroy the world. And uh, the nanotech, so th thanks God everybody has forgotten this because it's, it's quite unrealistic. And I will tell you later why. Well, the reason why it's unrealistic is because of what I showed you before now of the nanomachines. In order to produce movement at the nanoscale, these nanomachines need a really controlled environment. This is the first lesson we're learning from the movies I showed you before. The, the, the little myosin is all, all able to walk forward because it has the right pH, the right salt, the right temperature. If you just move any of these parameters, 
it will unfold, it will not work. That's why it took so many years of evolution on Earth to create these nanomachines, because it takes a long time to create a perfect environment so this nanomachine can work. Actually, the Earth is 4.5 billion years old, and life on Earth came out pretty early. So four billion years ago, it Life happened quite quickly on Earth. But after life happened, we have mass extinction after mass extinction until, for example, the uh, oceans managed to have constant pH. This was achieved in a moment of evolution with some plankton starting to be able to stabilize the pH of the Earth. Um, this is why it's very unlikely we're going to have a goo coming out of the labs, because it can only work in very specific environments, and that's also why worrying what is happening with global warming and the changes of pH in the ocean, because we may revert to situations of mass extinction. So at the same time we were doing this, chemists became very good at starting to build nanomaterials. So the sciences were converging at a nanoscale. Famously, Harry Crotter in the UK, for example, got a Nobel Prize in 1985, I think, for the discovery of the fullerenes. And immediately, not only physicists that were trying to understand how nanomachines worked, or chemists, people started to think, OK, we can use this for medicine. So why? For example, in chemotherapy, one of the main problems you have when you have a tumor and then remove the tumor or not remove the tumor, but you have some drugs that we know get rid, at least for a while, of cancer cells. Um, what you need to kill those cancer cells is that enough concentration of drugs reach those cancer cells to create them. So to do that, you need to put really high concentration of chemicals, and that's why chemotherapy is so horrible, because you, you have to kill your body in order to kill the tumor. So people immediately thought, that you could use nanoparticles to actually concentrate the drugs into the tumors. This was one of the first applications of nanotechnology to medicine. This was pretty much encouraged because again in the 1980s, Maeda in Japan finds out that nanoparticles actually accumulate in tumors. The reason for this is that when you have a tumor growing in you, uh, it needs to feed itself. So it starts to create a lot of blood vessels around it. But these blood vessels are of poor quality. They have what they call defenestrations. And the nanoparticles go through them and accumulate in the cancer cells. So for a long time, basically from the 1980s forward, people have been designing in a very reductionist thinking type of thinking, we just make a magic nano bullet. It will go to the tumor and will kill it. People have been incredibly creative. They put chemistry in this, they managed to make them magnetic, and then they made them oscillate at the tumor and make the tumor explode. They, they all sorts of um, very clever and sophisticated um, tactics to kill the tumors. But it, only very few drugs have been approved that are nanomedicine for killing tumors. Um, one of the main reasons is that the body clears nanoparticles. So your kidney and your liver get rid of all your attempts to keep the tumor before it reaches there. So one of the lessons that we have learned in the last 30, 40 years is that uh, just reproducing the thinking of pharmacology, trying to kill a tumor, doesn't work. We will not kill tumors just by targeting proteins or cells in proteins. Cells, the tumors for once, the body can clear your nanoparticles and can clear your drugs, and the tumors, even if you kill them for three, four months, you all know that they will evolve resistance to your drugs, to your nanoparticles. Another of the things we have learned is that the way most biology works, which is small teams or bigger teams of people that compete with each other, it's not been a very fruitful way to make breakthroughs in medicine. Um, so maybe fueled by this um, way of doing science that gives Nobel Prizes and, and produces big names, we've created a way of doing science where we create groups, small groups, around um, a very important person, and they all compete with each other, trying to see who is smarter than the others. One of the nice things of being a physicist is that we have learned that if we want to tackle very difficult problems, such as finding the Higgs boson, it's a very good idea to get together and compete at the same time as you collaborate. So this is something I, I think is also important in having physicists in medicine. Another area where nanotech was poised to make a big breakthrough was biosensing. Many of you may have heard of the 
a story of Theranos, which is a bit of a sad story. So there was, um, from the 1980s, I remember I was doing, I was in Japan. Many companies in Japan are still working on it. Um, we were trying to um, find ways in which we can make an electronic device in which we just put a drop of, water, of blood and would tell you what you have. You've been hearing this for the last 20, 30 years. We all heard the promise that we will have a device that we could just plug to our phone, and somehow this never materializes. And it's surprising when uh, um, this story of Theranos came that the, the woman that was convinced everybody in the world to give her money to create this company just went bust. She could convince anybody that she could do something that many, many people have tried to do for a very long time. So this is another area where just trying very quickly to get quick returns without collaborating, without looking at the, at the, at the science, it didn't quite work out. Um, luckily, uh, we're getting better at this. Um, uh, actually, um, we are, after the hypes, come the slow work of many people, and especially that we're starting to have breakthroughs in the US and Korea and Japan from companies that have been working for 20, 30 years in collaborations with universities and lots of teams of multidisciplinary teams that are able to start to be able to do things like this patch here. A patch full of nanoneedles that you put on your skin and it's able to measure in real time the concentration of glucose that you have in your blood to release insulin in real time. Um, as these things were happening, other people were trying to use biology as building blocks for materials. The most famous case, which also starts in the 1980s, is DNA nanotechnology. So, Nadrian Seaman, uh, who was a DNA scientist in New York, uh, he says that looking at this picture, uh, came up with the idea that you could use DNA, you know, DNA has the shape it has because the DNA bases are complementary and they only bind to, to specific places. So he could use them as Lego blocks to construct, uh, so use DNA as Lego blocks to construct things that they will just fold by themselves. So um, he's, he succeeded. He could have started to create a lot of uh, interesting shapes with DNA. And the real breakthrough came with the work, well, there's been many breakthroughs, but maybe the most beautiful breakthrough came from Paul Rothermood at Caltech in 2006, which created something called DNA origami. What you see here, these little shapes here, they look with anatomic for a microscope, they're tiny, they're structures made of DNA. And he had this wonderful idea that if you get the DNA of a virus, which is quite big, and then he created staples, so he designed the staples in the computer so they would find to specific places of the DNA, and then put them together, shake them, and the things will fold in the, in the way you want it, in the way you have designed in your computer. He showed that this approach, you could build anything out of DNA at a small scale. Letters, numbers, the people these days, um, are able to do also 3D structures. So DNA has become, DNA nanotechnology, one of the dreams of the initial nanotechnologies. We can now construct any shape we want and we're designing the computer out of DNA, we just put a shake in a bottle and it comes out. Uh, we can do it in 3D and we can, people even do sculptures of little bears and uh, all sorts of sophisticated shapes. I have also contributed to this, um, collaborating with Japanese scientists, we made these DNA ties that they assemble on cells and the idea is that we could pull from cells or do. The main problem of DNA nanotechnology, which is again a very reductionist idea, you just get building blocks and build structures, is that nobody very much manages to do anything useful out of it. Until very recently, I will show you later. So we build the capacity to build little smiley faces and little teddy bears or anything we like out of DNA, but um, it's very difficult to interface with a nanoscale. This is one of the problems of nanotechnology we have in all the fields of nanotechnology. You can fabricate tiny things and look at them with our wonderful atomic force microscopes, uh, but how do you wire that? How do you use that for any, doing anything practical? Uh, at this point, things are becoming more interesting. So, um, for a long time, as I told you, people have been interested, we have been interested in these wonderful building blocks of life that are 
proteins that seem to be able to make any possible work we want at the nanoscale. And more wonderfully, the cell and our bodies are able to put all that complexity together to create the structures that are us, that can move and can think and they can talk. And for a long time, the scientific community has been very interested in being able to produce, to understand how these strings, that are proteins, fold into themselves to create, to learn how they do it, so we don't need synchrotrons to know the, the structures of proteins, but also to understand sort of the secrets of nature to create these amazing nanomachines. This was thought to be an impossible problem to solve. Uh, so for many years, people have tried all sorts of tactics, incredible computer simulations, massive teams of people, but in early 21st century, things started to get very interesting. Um, David Baker is, is the, maybe the most famous of this field, but there are many others that have been working here. And he started many things that are new of the way we do science in the first 21st century. First, he started to do crowdsourcing. So he started to get people all over the world to use first, to give him give his team computer power, so he could have bigger power for simulations from their mobile phones, from their computer. And also then start also to design little games, so people would just go and play with the games, and they will help them to find the structures. So already thinking, using human intelligence as well as simulation as you try to solve the structure. But the breakthrough, the reason why he completely changed the game uh, was because he used evolution. So for most of the 20th century, for, I mean, for more history, when we were trying to make computer simulations and understand how matter comes together, we only use physics. So we had building blocks, we shake them and see how they come together, right? But doing that, you could never predict the structure of a protein. So they have a competition in this field. This field knows that collaboration and competition of big communities are important to succeed, unlike the nano drug delivery system people. And he went to the competition, and in the competition they give them the structure of a protein that nobody knows. And usually nobody comes up with the correct answer to the folded structure. But that year, he did, a few years ago, three, four years ago, he did. And then the judges thought he either cheated or he solved the protein folding uh, problem. So the reason he did it is because he looked at the evolutionary history of the protein. So instead of just getting the building blocks, he looked at how these building blocks, because now we have a lot of information about the genetics of organisms, have evolved since we have information, since the origin of life on Earth. And then from there, he could identify the important points, and then he could fold the protein. Um, this is a radical departure from the way we've been thinking about computer simulations in the 20th century. Now, if we want to solve the problems of biology, physics and chemistry and all that is not enough, we need to take into account the evolutionary history of Earth, which is maybe the most uh, radical power that we can unleash in the 21st century. So, as soon as he managed to get the protein structures, he worked out the, pro the problem in reverse. So what happens if I design a protein in the computer and then I go and I get a cell to produce the protein for me? A protein that doesn't exist in nature. He calls them the novel protein design or protein designers. So he went to the computer and he built these shapes in the computer, and then they create the genes, and they took the genes to a yeast or a bacteria or some small microorganism, and they got it to work in reverse, and then to get the bacteria or the yeast to produce the structure. So the way he does this, he's able to get these things to assemble with each other and create artificial constructions that don't exist in nature out of something you design in the computer, but you use biology, synthetic, this is what we call synthetic biology, to build for you. This is a radical departure of how we have produced technology up to now. So all the 20th century, we got building blocks, we got molecules, and then we put them together using physics, trying to alter nature. What is happening now is that we're learning the tricks of nature to create matter. So these are not metallic nanobots, 
what we're doing is to create, use, mix our reductionist approaches with the approaches of nature to create things that don't exist. And this is one of the first examples of things they're starting to build. So he called here in a paper a couple of years ago, a protein assembly encapsulating his own RNA genome. What it says, this is an artificial virus. So he created in the computer a protein, and then they put the RNA, and the protein will create a cage similar to a virus, and then they put the RNA inside the virus, and then they put it in a cell culture, and the thing started to evolve. So they have created an artificial structure able to evolve. Um, this is probably going to be one of the future of, of, uh, of vaccines. We don't know what it is. Um, similarly, the people of DNA nanotechnology are starting to become more clever than just building teddy bears. And they're starting to think of mixing themselves with the protein nanotechnologists and start to create, for example, drug factories. One of the reasons why we don't have enough drugs and the drugs we have fail is because Normal chemistry can only build so many things in these containers. As I showed you before, biology uses nanomachines to create things. So these people are trying to use the structure, the, the way we do biology, to create molecules that we cannot uh, create with chemistry. Uh, a few weeks ago, the first time I see DNA nanotech in the Times, um, comes out DNA trap to ensnare viruses. So people are already uh, creating very complex DNA structures combined with proteins that are able to work as vaccines. So while all these guys were busy building proteins and DNA, physicists like me were starting to ask more profound questions about um, the origin of life and um, using the nanotech techniques. So what you see here, so that's DNA, that's DNA with one of our microscopes. So one of the things we're starting to get very interested in is in how we can use our new techniques and our new ability to look at matter at the nanometer scale to understand why life emerged at all from nanostrings. So what is happening right now is not that we're starting to be able to use the power of nature to create new technology, but we are also starting to be able to look at the physics of life. So I tell you now what we think life emerged on Earth. So the reason why uh, life emerged from nanostrings is that, as you know, probably you all know, entropy grows in the universe. Yet we are the opposite. We are creating complexity. How can this be possible? So imagine the early Earth, and we had maybe water there, and the first molecules start to come together. One of the reasons that life is possible is when molecules come together and form strings, the strings start moving. I just saw you before. If you put a nanostring in water, they shake. As soon as they shake, they're interacting with the environment and they're moving energy into the environment. And in non-equilibrium thermodynamics, as we call it, we know that when we put energy into the environment, you can become more complex. So as soon as you become a string, you have the capacity to become more complex being a string. You are able to use temperature and movement to create a structure. And if you are able to create a structure that survives over time, so you are there, and suddenly you come into a little knot. And that knot survives over time. The reason it survives over time is because the information is getting around it. It's allowing it to survive. The movement is producing, the way it's changing the environment, is allowing it to survive over time. What does it mean? It means it's storing information about the environment. So as soon as you start to store information and to be able to move, you start able also at the same time, as I told you, to catalyze chemical reactions. So you're coupling movement and chemistry and complexity and information. And out of all this, and of course, evolution. Evolution means the selection of the shapes that survive over time. You start creating a natural computing machine, a computing machine that is able to store information from the universe around it in its shape. We are shape and we are movement. In our shape, to create intelligence. Intelligence means to read the environment and survive the environment. And often, as the strings and the chemistry, to 
modify the environment. That's the origin of life. And we are in an exciting time because we're starting to have the capacity to have new experiments, new simulations, computer simulations, AI, uh, very new mathematics that is allowing us to understand or start to answer these questions of why the universe creates life, what's the origin of intelligence, and what is the role of the evolutionary history of life on Earth to create the life we have right now. So we are moving away from the initial picture I showed you at the beginning of genes and scissors to a much more beautiful and complicated paradigm in which we emerge from the rules that create the universe into complex structures that are entangled with the environment. If we are what our environment makes of us, and we modify the environment in both ways. Inside of us is the physics of the universe that gets us to live, and we are moving into the science of complexity. We're starting to be able to interrogate biology, not just as genes or molecules, but in trying to understand is mathematics, is pattern formation. What I'm showing you here in this picture is the growth of, uh, of the larva of um, Drosophila, a fly. And what I showed at the beginning of the video was like the fly at the beginning, and then you can see how life happens. A lot of shaking, a lot of movement, a lot of communication, a lot of pattern formation. This is life, and this we're having for the first time in history. The intellectual and also the mathematical and experimental tools to start to tackle uh, the most wonderful and complicated problem we know of in the universe. So, um, as summary of all these things I just told you before, uh, we started to change the way we look at biology in the sense that we are trying to encompass all this complexity, not just genes and proteins, but trying to understand how biology emerges from Earth, how it creates complex behaviors, leads to intelligence and leads to planetary ecosystems. But it's not only biology, and nanotech and medicine that are interested in uh, how we harness complexity. Um, as I told you now, we're now starting to understand how embedded in a structure, in any biological structure, is the capacity to, um, to learn. So for example, computer simulations became good when the structure of machine learning algorithms started to mimic the structure of the layer structure of our brains. Before that, the algorithms were not able um, to translate. And just by copying, we still don't know how they work, just copying the structure a little bit of our brain, we started to get better at, at translating and at playing Go. Uh, one of the things we think it works with this thing is because Embedded in the structure of our brain is also embedded the structure of the physical laws of the universe. So um, we are getting to the point where structure, biological structure and intelligence are converging. So this is a video of a mold, a mold that grows on, on, um, on wood. And people have figured out how to use this mold for doing difficult computations. What you see here is the map of Tokyo, and in the little blobs are the main stations of the Tokyo area. And what you have in the middle is a mold, and the mold is started to grow as it fits. In order to fit itself best, it's able to compute the best routes between the hubs that you have put in the metro map of Tokyo, and basically the mold is able to reproduce the original map. So we are learning many things about computation and how computation emerges um, from a structure. Another interesting thing, and I'll show you, that's the last one. I'll show you this is not only biological structure is able to compute. These are nanowires that have been put together in a plate and are very highly interconnected. Um, so when you put on here, let me see if I get the laser pointer back. The signals of the traffic of Los Angeles 
and you go with an electrical signal through it when you're very small, and at the nanoscale, you start to change the structure. And if you let this structure learn, a bit like a machine learning algorithm, but this time it's physical, after a day of getting signals, it's able to predict from the other side the patterns of the traffic of Los Angeles. So what we are learning is like embedded in the structure of the universe is the capacity of intelligence. Uh, and we are still at the very early beginning of all that. So in a similar way, we have learned that uh, in the last five years, immunotherapy is all over the place in the press. Um, is becoming the most promising tool for fighting cancer. Immunotherapy is a very radical departure from the pharmacology paradigm we had in the 21st century. In the 20th century, we were just trying to kill tumors uh, using drugs and using proteins. Why does uh, immunotherapy work? Because like in the case of protein nanotechnologists, we are not using building blocks. We're using biology, we're using the whole life. So in this case, we're using your immune system to fight cancer. So you're giving signals to the immune system to recognize cancer. And this is where actually nanotechnology is becoming very useful. So nanotechnology, nanoparticles accumulate in the spleen, and then they can be used to train the immune system. Another beautiful example here is how nanoparticles, um, this just published last week, are used to bring molecules to the immune cell system so they can kill bacteria during sepsis, even in cases where they are antibiotic resistant. So not just using the nanoparticle, but using the nanoparticle together with your cells, together with nature, harnessing complexity, you can reach medical solutions. People are also working on implants, implant vaccines that you can implant near a tumor, giving constant signals to the tumor, uh, so, the tumor rec so the immune system recognizes the tumor as something foreign they can get rid of. And this is in clinical trials and is very able to clear a lot of cancers. So other things people are doing with nanotech is to create tissues, and with this maybe I will finish. Uh, so another thing we have learned is that when cells um, are in an environment, they just don't feel it. Uh, chemically, they also feel it mechanically, and so they, when you put a cell on the surface, they will stick to it, they pull from it, and they will learn when they are, and they will change the behavior. So if you have a stem cell, and you put it on something as soft as brain, after a while, it will turn to something into a neuron. Or if you put a stem cell, and you put it something as hard as, as at heart, it will turn into something like heart. So people are using these techniques to create, for example, artificial uh, cartilage, on to create uh, body parts that you tissue engineer. In this case, there was another scandal that people tried to go very fast and we were making them of plastic. The only ones that work is when you actually get the structures from a donor and then you put the donor cells on it, the, the patient cells on it. It's also starting to work uh, for repairing spinal cord injuries. Uh, so one of the reasons where you can't movement until you have a spinal cord injury is because the neurons don't communicate with each other. And people are trying, are managing to make nanostructures that allow chemically nanostructures, sorry, electrically conducting nanostructures that allow the cells to um, communicate. People are also making artificial organs. Maybe you have heard of 3D printed organs. Um, basically reproducing the physics and the mechanics of tissues in a small construct. We're still very far away from producing a big heart. But one of the biggest successes is that we're starting to be able to use these uh, artificial tissues to uh, test drugs. So we can check for drug toxicity, drug toxicity, avoiding animal testing, which could be a massive breakthrough. So, uh, what we are learning is that um, in the future, probably medicine will look very different. We will have um, biosensing devices that will tell us in real time what is going on in our body, and then we will get increasingly sophisticated mathematical models, artificial intelligence simulation to make sense of all the signals we're getting. We're still there, very far from that. There are many pieces that need to put together, but we're getting there. And somehow one beautiful thing is that this brings us closer to the dream of traditional medicines. If you see in Chinese, for example, traditional medicine, there's these people that are specialized in getting the pulse. 
So people that machine learn themselves over many years to understand if you're healthy or not through your pulse. And I think this is exactly what we're trying to do. We're trying to make devices and we're trying to get an artificial system that would just, with a little measurement, tell us how are us. So this is taking us, and this is something, to what I call transmaterial futures. So by learning the recipes of nature to create matter and putting it together with what we knew before, uh, we're starting to create matter that doesn't exist in nature. And a beautiful example I have brought you here is this cyborg stingray made by Kit Parker in Harvard a few years ago. So what you see here is a little structure made of plastic. And sitting on the plastic is uh, a circuit made with rat cells, so the heartbeat of cells. So this thing is able to use the capacity of cells to beat, not in a heart, but in an artificial structure to be able to swim. And moreover, I think these cells are sensitive to light, so the sting ray is able to follow light. Um, so these are the kind of crazy things people are starting to think about. And so, basically, uh, what I'm trying to tell you is that the conversion in science and technologies is eroding the scientists, the, the boundaries between material and biological sciences, and we, we will be uh, increasingly merging with complexity. So we will not longer, I think, continue, or I mean, we'll still have all, a lot of inertia over many years of just trying to target individual things and trying to um, uh, control DNA or proteins, although we're still trying to do this, and it still will be part of the arsenal. But um, we will increasingly be harnessing biological complexity for creating um, medical applications and instill future devices. So if you want to know what I do, uh, I work in uh, several problems. So one of the things I do is I'm trying to understand plants. I'm trying to understand how plants, plants don't have brains. So they just have their structure and their structure and their growth to try to understand the, the world around them. So I'm trying to understand sort of plant intelligence and how plants in evolution are able to create shapes that read the world. I also work in how we can use ultrasound to control uh, neurons. So, uh, you know neurons are electrical, but they're also mechanical. And we have learned in recent years that if you focus on ultrasound in your brain, things like trembling uh, from Parkinson can, sto can stop. And we're trying to understand why, and we're trying to maybe use it for pain. And uh, we are also, and I'm going to show this here because one of my students is here today, and she's working on this, trying to understand how pancreatic tumors kills you with uh, um, physics. So the reason why pancreatic tumor kills you is because it's so clever, it creates a mesh of nanowires around it that doesn't allow the chemotherapy go through it or the immune system going through it. And we're trying to use uh, the tools for physics to understand how, uh, how uh, we can use things like ultrasound to create um, better treatments and improve the um, the efficiency of uh, chemotherapy. Okay, I finished here because I'm late. Uh, thank you for your attention.